Today is going to be a slightly different video since I want to be a bit more informative in this one and just kind of go over briefly what exactly you need to get into if you want to talk about basic PHP security. So you're going to learn about basic PHP security in this video here, but like I said, we're not gonna go too deep detail into each one of them. I will give a few code examples so you know a little bit about what exactly you need to do. But it is important to keep in mind that you can always go very deep into PHP security, and these are the basic ones that you need to get started with in order to just know the basics when it comes to PHP security. Some of the ones I'm gonna talk about in this video here is something I have done a video on in the past. So if there is a specific one that we have already covered, then I will leave a link for that in the description so you can check that out. And for the ones I haven't covered yet on this channel, I will leave a empty space for that in the description. So once I do add a video on that in the future, then I will go back and update the links inside the description. So you have a specific video for that topic. So now the first one we're going to talk about here is something called SQL injection. And SQL injection is something we have done quite a bit inside my channel here since that is pretty much an essential thing. Well, all of these are essential. Uh, but SQL injection is a way for you to protect your database from any sort of user that might maliciously try to go inside any sort of input inside your website. So for example, a login system, you have a username and password input, and they can go inside one of those inputs and type in code. And if they were to do that, they can actually send a code command to your database and start deleting things or you know, something that might destroy your database, which is not a good thing. The way we defend against that is of course using prepared statements. That is basically when we go inside our code and instead of just querying the database immediately using the data that the user submitted, we separate the data from the query, send the query in first, and then send the user data afterwards. And that sort of way we can defend our database against SQL injection since we separate these different tasks. And we do have a code example here inside my notes that I can paste in for you to see. And I will go ahead and wrap this down on two lines since it is cutting off a little bit there. But basically all you have to do here is create a prepared statement where you go in and create this SQL code that you're going to send to the database, you prepare it, and then afterwards you submit the data that the user submitted. So in this case here, a username. So we use a placeholder inside our query to say that okay, this is going to get filled in later on. And then later on, we bind the data to our placeholder and then we execute our placeholder data. So we just send it in afterwards. And again, SQL injection is something we have covered extensively on my channel inside my, my latest PSP course here. So if you want to know more about when it comes to SQL injection, you're more than welcome to visit the link in the description. The next thing I want to talk about is something called cross-site scripting, which is also a very popular way to mess up a website. Basically what you do is whenever you have any sort of output from a user, for example, from a database, or if a user submitted some data inside a input, and then you output it directly inside your website, it is important that you go in and do something about that data before you output it inside your website. Because if the user were to do something where they submit some code, for example, some JavaScript, and then you output it inside the website without doing anything to that data, then it is possible for a user to go inside your website and actually run some code inside your website. This is also something that can actually get submitted into a database. So if you're not careful, it is important that any sort of time you output any sort of data from a user, whether it being data that they submitted into a database, that you always go in and do something about data before you actually output it. So let's go ahead and take an example here. Let's say I go inside my website and I grab a username from an input. For example, you know, something the user submitted, this is something Thing they can submit and it can be whatever they feel like. Uh, for example, a piece of JavaScript code or something else they might just you know feel like injecting into our website. And what we basically just do is whenever I want to output data, I can go in and I can sanitize the data by adding a HTML special characters function, which is built inside PHP that takes that data and converts it to HTML special characters, which is, for example, instead of using ampersands, then it uses the, the HTML characters for that particular ampersand, so it's not going to actually be an ampersand. Uh, but when it actually get output inside your website, it will get converted back to an ampersand. So there's kind of like a, a weird little in-between here where we convert it to something else, and then when we output it, we convert it back again to an ampersand in order to avoid any sort of code getting output inside our website. It is important to mention here as well that it is best practice to not do any sort of sanitation like we just did here when you insert data into a database. But once you take the data from inside the database and output it inside your website, then you need to do it. 
And the reason for that is that in some cases for specific types of applications where we don't want to have HTML special characters inside our database because that makes it unusable in some types of applications, uh, we don't want to have it inside our database as HTML special characters. So just know that it's best practice to sanitize data after when you actually want to output the data. The next thing we're going to talk about is something called cross-site request forgery, which is another way where a hacker basically makes you do things that you don't want to do inside a website. Uh, this could, for example, be if you're logged into a place where you can buy things or something like that. And when you log in for the first time, then a hacker maybe makes you click on a certain link that takes you in and actually runs a script inside your browser to make you do unwanted actions inside that particular website that you're logged into. This can be through a link or an email or advertisement, you know, any sort of code that has any sort of maliciousness to it that you then click on uh, can make you do things inside a website that you're currently logged into. So in order to avoid that, we do have a method to do so. And I do also have that inside my notes here. So a basic example of this is to go in and create something called a CSRF token, which basically makes you go inside your website. Uh, you create a random byte that you convert to hexadecimals, which is going to generate this weird string of characters that is hexadecimal characters. And then we use the data inside this session variable to compare together with any sort of request data that we might have inside the website, for example, using a form where we have a hidden input. And inside this hidden input, we could, for example, have the CSRF token. And when we send that request, we then compare the session variable to that token to verify the authenticity of that particular user who is currently using the website. The next thing we're going to talk about is security when it comes to file uploads, which we haven't covered yet inside my channel. But essentially, whenever you want to upload a file using a form, you know, because that's something we can do, uh, then you do want to make sure that you always check if that file is of a particular type and that it also is of a particular extension, because if a user tries to send something bad using a file into your website, then you want to make sure that it has the proper extension and file format in order for that to be properly authenticated. I don't know what I did this because it is getting authenticated as the correct type of file that the user is actually submitting. So again, to give an example here, let's say we actually just submitted a form that has a file inside of it. And then inside the other page, where we actually have to handle that file and do something with it using PHP. We can go in and create a variable called allowed types. So we basically say what kind of file type will we actually allow inside our website. So we store that inside an array and we can just keep putting, you know, commas and, and file formats that you might want to accept inside this particular website here. And then we also create one for allowed extension. So if it's going to be a JPEG, you know, for the both kinds of JPEGs, if it's going to be PNG or GIF, so whatever you might want to accept, you know, maybe PDF files or something, then you go down and actually grab the actual file that was submitted by referring to a super global called files, we can go in and say you want to grab the file key and say what kind of type this particular file is. So in this case here, it is going to tell you whether or not this is going to, for example, be a image slash JPEG or image slash PNG or whatever. And then we can also check for the extension here. And then we basically just go down inside our if condition and say if our allowed types or allowed extension exists inside what we just grabbed here when it comes to the information about this particular file that was submitted from the form. So if that exists inside that file, then we will allow for something to happen. For example, uploading the file so to speak. Again, we haven't really covered this specifically inside my channel, although I do think I might have a really old seven year old tutorial on this that actually talks a bit about this, how to upload files and do this sort of thing. But I don't have any new tutorials on this. So if you want to know more about this, then now you understand a little bit about the basics of it to sort of help you understand other tutorials a little bit better. So you know exactly what you're getting into. The next thing we're going to talk about is password storage and hashing. And this is something we have also covered on this channel here. So if you want to store any sort of sensitive data, uh, and you want to, you know, be able to compare that data with something that is being submitted inside the website, for example, a login system, uh, if you sign up a user and they have to, you know, have their password stored inside a database, and then once they log into the website, you have to compare that password they used to log in with the password inside your database, then it is a very good idea that the password inside the database is not something you can actually read. So that is what we use hashing for. We basically take a, a piece of data, for example, a password, and then we hash it to make it unreadable. So you would have to figure out a way to 
try and, and read it, which is, you know, close to impossible. So hashing is very important. And I do, again, have an extensive tutorial on this, but we can just briefly talk about it here. Uh, so inside my notes, I'm just going to paste in what I have. Uh, basically, you have a password submitted by the user that is then sent to another PHP file, which in this case is this file here. We grab the password from the user. And before we actually store it inside the database, again, using prepared statements, which we talked about in the first example in this video here, then you want to make sure you take the password and you set it equal to a new variable where you basically just go in and hash the password using either password underscore default or password underscore bcrypt. In this case, I'm using bcrypt because you can actually uh, add a delay or what is called a cost factor to the hashing mechanism. In this case, yeah, I didn't include that inside my example, but that is something you can do. Now I might as well show it. So if we go up here and we create a array, we're going to call this one options. We're going to set this one equal to an array. So we're going to say brackets here. Then we're going to go after and say we want to add a, a piece of data. So in this case, it is going to be the cost. So we're going to say we have a cost and we point to a value, which is going to be somewhere between 10 and 12, because that is the normal that you might want to do. Then you take this options here and you paste it inside as the last parameter inside your function down here. And in this sort of way, we now have a cost factor to, you know, add a delay inside our website to, you know, not allow brute forcing of a certain password. Uh, so this is something that is good to have when it comes to, you know, making people not automatically just spam random passwords inside a password input uh, with a particular username so they can try and guess the right password at some point. So this is going to make this a lot more difficult since it is going to add a huge delay, which makes it just not worth it to try and brute force their way into the website. So this is a good idea. And this is something you can add whenever you use the password underscore bcrypt. So that is why I recommend using password underscore bcrypt and not password underscore default. And then of course, once we actually grab the actual password from the database, so this is a little bit later on, let's say now we have to log into the website. So this is for signing up inside the website. This is for logging into the website. Then you grab the password from the database, which is this one over here, which is called hash password. And then you just basically compare it to the password the user submitted when they tried to log into the website. And if this is returning as one or as true, then it means that these are the same passwords. So in this kind of way, we can compare two pieces of data, even though they are hashed and we can't really read them uh, to see if they are in fact the same. Then we do also have something called input validation and data sanitation. So basically, whenever we have a user submit some kind of data inside our website using a you know any sort of form, and then we have to do something about that form to sanitize the data to make sure this is the correct data being submitted, uh, then we can go in and we can actually go ahead and validate and sanitize that particular data to again ensure that this is the correct data they are submitting. So they're not trying to do any funky business inside our website. Now, I do think it is a good idea to just sort of paste in the code here and then talk about it afterwards. So in this example here, we have a user submitting a email and then we basically just go in and we, you know, we go in and filter it to see if this is actually a valid email format. This is a little bit different than using HTML special characters because HTML special characters takes the data and then makes it into a non-dangerous data by going in and using HTML special characters to convert it into HTML special characters. But using a filter, whether it being filter underscore input or filter underscore variable, in this case, it is filter underscore var, uh, we can go in and we can actually check if this is a valid piece of data. If it is not, it is going to return as false. So there is a slight difference between using HTML special characters because that will actually just go in and make the data non-dangerous, whether or not the data is something they used to try to submit as something dangerous. Whereas this one is straight up going to say, oh, okay, this data is not what was intended. So therefore we are not going to allow it. And there are many different types of filter underscore var. You can actually see if I go in here and I start typing filter underscore, you know, you can see we start getting something here. I can also, you know, take a little bit further. If I say validate, then we can validate for all types of things, for example, integers and URLs and that kind of thing. Um, that kind of thing, that kind of thing. So there are many different types you can filter for. So, you know, filtering information is a very good idea whenever you have to use data inside a piece of code. The last one here is also a important one that isn't really covered in a lot of tutorials because it isn't really something that is, you know, necessary and something that people most likely won't point out that frequently. Uh, so if I make a tutorial on something and, you know, and I don't take this particular consideration into consideration, then it's not something people are going to comment on underneath the 
the video, so therefore you just don't see people who upload tutorials do this sort of security very often. Uh, but this is basic when it comes to error handling and information leakage. So whenever you do any sort of thing using PHP to verify data that the user submitted using any sort of error handling that you might include inside your code to check, you know, for example, are inputs empty or something. Whenever you encounter any sort of error message inside the website, it is not a good idea to have that error message being displayed inside the actual website. And I'm more specifically talking about error messages generated by the actual PHP and not something that you created manually as a user where you go in and say, oh, okay, well, as we run into this error message here, then I'm gonna write uh, invalid username or something inside the, the username form. I'm talking about specific error messages generated automatically by PHP and any sort of error messages in this sort of way is something that you shouldn't really post inside a website because it is something that can maybe leak some sensitive data or just give the, the hacker any sort of information about what is going on inside your PHP code. So instead you should put your error messages and log it inside a separate file. So you, the developer can go in and check these error messages without actually the user seeing anything inside the website. A brief example of this is a line of code that you can use here, which is a error underscore log function that exists inside PHP. Basically you take the error message and you put it inside as the first parameter. And then this number over here basically tells our function that this is something we're gonna store inside a file. And then we basically give it the path to the file that we want to log the error in. So in this sort of way, it's going to print that error inside a particular file. Uh, so we can see it as the developer, but not the user inside the website. Again, the less the user know, the better. That's basically what the concept is here. And the last thing I just want to touch upon here is also something called session security, which is also a video I have on my channel. So whenever it comes to any sort of session security inside your website, you know, you go inside a website, you have a user who has signed up inside your website and now they log into your website, then you're going to store some data inside a session or, you know, not necessarily when it comes to a login system, but just when it comes to any sort of thing that your website has to remember across pages and you store those information inside a session. Uh, so whenever it comes to session security, there are many different things to discuss. For example, not to store any sort of sensitive information inside a session, uh, not to keep any sort of data that you don't need anymore inside a session. So always unset that data if you don't need it anymore, but also more specifically making sure that the session ID is not a weak ID that you're using inside your session. Because when you use the session underscore start, which looks something like this, so we say session underscore start parentheses, then this session here is a very weak and not so good session to start up inside your website. So we do have another function that we can use inside our code, which is called session underscore regenerate underscore ID, which we can set equal to true. And in this sort of way, we now take the current session ID and we make it even stronger. And this is something that is going to allow for us to go in and actually make sure that if another hacker were to actually hijack your session and have that session you know, available to them, then we go in and we regenerate the ID to make sure that, okay, so now the session they stole is no longer valid because now we changed the session for this particular user who is using that session. And this is something you should be doing fairly often inside your code. You should, for example, write a script that automatically goes in and regenerates the ID every 30 minutes or something. Also, whenever you do any sort of validation, when you lock in a user, for example, inside your website, you should also run this function here. Uh, so this is just a really good idea to use regenerate ID in order to make your ID even stronger and to make sure any sort of hijacks are going to become invalid. So having talked about all these different types of security measures that we have inside PHP, this is going to give you a good foundation to when it comes to protecting your application. Of course, you can go very deep into security, but this is the fundamentals that you need to know when you get into PHP for the first time, or at least when you have learned PHP and now you want to start creating applications that you can use inside a actual website, then you need to know at least these as a basics when it comes to learning about PHP security. So with this video here, I hope you got a lot of information and you know, because I know a lot of people on my channel are beginners. So giving a quick informative video like this is something I like to do and might do more of in the future instead of just sitting there writing a bunch of code showing you how to create certain applications. Uh, so this is something that I hope to incorporate a little bit more into my channel. So I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you guys in the next video.